wait and see what, what might, might transpire. Or maybe our sister way in the back there, Sister Tara, and she shared a little bit before. Amen. God bless you. All right, so tonight we're going to talk about the application of hermeneutics. It's the last lesson. And um, how can we apply the principles of hermeneutics to the verses of Scripture? <clears throat> to interpret Scripture is not just to pull something out of the air and just say, well, I'm, I'm going to... Uh, I'm, I'm going to give an interpretation to a, a scripture in the Bible. There are um, practical uh, things that we got to do. Uh, when, when God wrote the Bible through, through men, he gave them words and paragraphs and phrases and sentences and, and, and so forth and verbs and nouns and adjectives to put together to form a co cohesive uh, statement. And so we need to also understand that there are certain laws, if you will, of interpretation. You just can't put a meaning into it. You've got to take the meaning out of it. Amen? So there's certain things that we can do. Let's take a passage for an example and apply it to what we have learned uh, so far. Remember, every hermeneutical principle will not always apply to every verse or passage. We've, we've gone over several of them before. However, every principle needs to be taken into consideration to achieve an accurate interpretation of the pas passage. So the passage we're going to look at tonight is Matthew 24, verse 40. Now, there's different uh, commentators that say the meaning of this is in different meanings and different uh, uh, interpretations, but I believe there's, there's only one. But I'll give, you, I'll give you an example. Okay. Here the scripture says, Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Now, let's look at the NLT. It says, two men will be working together in the field. One will be taken, the other left. The uh, century uh, English version says this, two men will be in the same field, but only one will be taken, the other will be left. So let's look at the context principle and see if it applies to the verse. We have to ask the question, who is speaking in this verse? Jesus. Exactly. So see, you're, you're applying hermeneutical principle. You're asking the question, who is speaking in this verse? And it's very important for you to get the true meaning of the Scripture. Jesus is clearly the speaker in this verse. Look at verse 4. You can see that. You don't have to turn there, but if you look at verse 4, you'll see it's Jesus speaking there. To whom is this verse addressed? To whom is it addressed? Yes, <laughs> exactly. He is speaking to his disciples. Look at verse 3. You can go to verse 3 for me in 24 so you can get the gist of it. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, tell us, there's a clue, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? and of the end of the world. So here we see very clearly that they're asking him a question, and then in verse 4, you're going to see that Jesus responds to them. Amen? And Jesus answered and said unto them. So notice that there's a conversation going on, there's a dialogue going on, and Jesus is, 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 is there privately with them, and they ask him a three-point question. And the answer that Jesus gives them is to them. Very important that you understand that. Now, when we look at the book of Matthew, we ask as a whole, who was the book of Matthew written to? Absolutely. He was written to the Jews. How do we know that? Go back into chapter 1 and see the genealogy, and it goes all the way through the Abraham and uh, all the way through uh, Isaac and Jacob and all the way through King David and the lineage, all the way through up until Christ. And the Gentiles don't need to know that for no reason. So Matthew rep represents uh, David or the house of David or the royal lineage to the king of Israel. And so because he's in the genealogy and because he was born through the, through the, through the family of David, Jesus Christ has every right to take that throne of Israel. Amen? Okay, good. I'm glad we all agreed on that one. 
Okay. So now we see that because the book of Matthew was written to the Jews, there are principles and there are applications that you and I can apply to our very life, but we cannot change the original intent of the letter and who it was written to. And the moment we do that, we get into danger of, of misapplying the Scripture or getting in, uh, improper interpretation of Scripture. So it's very, very important that we understand what every book was written for. Uh, the book of Matthew represents Jesus Christ as king. If you go right through the whole thing, you'll see it. About, he talks about the kingdom, and he, and he talks about establishing that kingdom and coming back again. That's fact, that's one of the things that they, they mentioned to him in verse 3 when he said, go back to verse 3, and he, says, and he says, tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and at the end of the world? Because they wanted to know when Jesus was going to come back and remove the tyranny of the Roman Empire from them. So we have to understand that. So we see that he's addressing the disciples. What does the verse literally say? The verse simply says that one of two men were in the field, one will be taken, and one out of the two men will be left. It does not say where, why, when, or how they will be taken. The verse does not specifically define the field as belonging to someone or as being in, partic in a particular place. So what are the key or repeated words in the passage? Well, there are no repeated words in this verse, but in the wider context, two words that reoccur, taken and left. This one was taken, this one's left. This one's taken, this one's left. Now, There's different ways of looking at the Scripture. I believe that in the end times, when Jesus is going to come back, just before the second coming, he, they asked him, right? Um, when, is the, when is this going to happen, and what shall be the sign? Let's go back to that verse. I think it's verse 4. It says, No, no, no. Was that at verse? Is it verse 3? Yeah. And he says, And when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Okay? So now we have to look at the end of the world. The tribulation period is not the end of the world. Because after the tribulation period is going to be a thousand-year millennial reign with Christ on the earth. So the earth can't be destroyed then. Okay? Then the Bible talks about in eschatology at the end times or the, uh, of the latter times that after the millennial kingdom, Satan's going to be loose for a short time. Okay? And during that time, there's going to be one more final battle, okay? which will be the battle of Armageddon. And then what's going to happen is the Lord's going to come back. Boom. He's going to settle everything. Now, what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? When Jesus is describing this particular par parallel, okay, a, a passage of Scripture, rather, he's saying and answering this question. Tell us when these things will be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world. Very important, end of the world. So we have a specific time frame. Jesus answers the question, and he tells them that there's going to be two in the field. Just before the end of the world, the end of destruction, I believe that that's during the time after the millennial kingdom. And it has to do with Israel. I don't believe it has to do anything with the Gentile. Some, some have made this to be a premillennial, uh, pre-tribulation rapture, but it's not. It's talking about Israel. He's talking about when are you going to restore the time unto Israel? When are you going to, when are you going to, uh, what is the sign of the coming? When are these things going to be? When is the end of the world? Jesus is answering that question. Okay. And then he goes on and he says this. Let me back up a minute. If you go back and you look uh, at the word taken and left, 
let's, let's go back to that point. I missed a point there. Taken and left. Taken and left. One will be taken, one will be left. The primary meaning of the word taken from Strong's Dictionary means to take to, to take with one's self, to join to one's self. The primary meaning of the word left, the Strong's number indicates that it is to let go or to send away or to leave or leave remaining. Now, if that's the case, there's going to be a white throne judgment. There's going to be a, a Bema seat judgment. Christians and those who are believers in Christ will go to the Bema seat judgment for the good and the bad that you've done in the body. But there's also a white throne judgment. And that white throne judgment is going to include Jews and Gentiles. It's going to be both. Because not all Israel will be saved. Now, you read in Romans, he talks about all Israel will be saved, but who is the real Israel? The real Israel are those who believe in Christ as Messiah. Because if that's the case, then people can be saved simply because, uh, can be si simply be saved without Jesus Christ and the shed blood. And that's not true. Okay? And so, um, and Paul goes into that, and I think it's in chapters 9, 10, and 11 in Romans, where he says, not all Israel will be saved, but there's a remnant. Amen? So we understand that. There are no specific people mentioned in this uh, scripture or two that are uh, two that which are unidentified. We don't know who they were. What are the places mentioned in the passage? There's no specific city. There's no specific place. So we don't under, we don't really get the fullness of that. But let's look at the immediate context of this verse, 36 to 44 of the same chapter. Now he's discussing the time element. He says, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, know the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now Jesus is speaking this. Now let me ask you this question. If Jesus is God in human flesh, and he is, how come he didn't know the answer to this? How come he says, no man knows the angels of heaven, but my Father only. How do we rectify that? This is part of the interpretation principles, too, of interpreting Scripture properly. If Jesus is God in human flesh, but he's also man in human flesh. So how could he make this statement to the disciples and tell them, my father only knows? Doesn't he know? He knew the heart of uh, Zacchaeus. He knew what people was, were thinking, and he, he corrected them, he gave them instruction. How come he doesn't know? We've got to have some theologians here, come on. Can somebody have an idea? Okay. Here Jesus was responding in his humanity. <clears throat> Remember when he was a child, it says he grew in wisdom and stature. But the Bible says all, wi all wisdom and knowledge is in him. So how could he grow? Well, it wasn't talking about his divine nature. It was talking about his human nature. So here, as he's telling his disciples, as a man, as Jesus, as a man that was born of the Virgin Mary, he doesn't know. But listen, many times the Bible says that he laid aside his divine prerogatives. Okay? Not that he doesn't know. As God, he does. The Bible says in 1 John, I believe it is, it says, there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father. What's the next one? No. No, it's the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. And these three are one. 
Was Jesus alive with the Father from the beginning of creation? Right? In the beginning was the Word of God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So as the Word, He never stopped being the Word. He knew all things. But as the little baby Jesus... He limited himself. And so he's responding here did not mean that he was not God in human flesh. That's how you refute those who would say, see, he's not, he can't be God because if he was God, he would know this. It's not understanding the hypostatic union of the two natures of Christ. Got it? Okay, so go next. Next verse. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Let's look at that for a moment. <clears throat> We're talking about applying hermeneutics. Let's look at this for a moment. He says, as, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So he does a parallel, Jesus does a parallel, and he uses the Old Testament scripture account in Genesis about Noah. What was going on during that time? Huh? There was violence. What else were they doing? Jesus talks about it. For as in the days they were before the flood, what were they doing? Okay, stop right there. They were eating and drinking. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. As it was in the days of Noah, what were they doing? What are we doing today? Eating and drinking. How many restaurants keep coming forward? All kinds of restaurants, all kinds of food. We see food on television, food network. We got everything, everything going on. Life is going on. It is just eating and drinking and eating and drinking, right? What else is going on? And now all these things are going on at the same time. They're marrying, right? And giving in marriage. Very possible meaning there is the homosexual marriage. Because it already talks about marriage. They're marrying, right? And giving in marriage. Until the day that Noah entered the ark. But what else was going on? Somebody's got to tell me. Somebody in this congregation, I know Facebook, they can't talk back. But somebody here has got to tell me what's going on besides that. Come on, somebody's got to tell me. What else is going on? Huh? No, no. We know sin's running rampant, they're being violent. What else is going on? They're not following God? Yeah, we know that. Yes! The word was being preached. He was a preacher of righteousness, and he was preaching, and he was telling them. Now understand, I want you to understand for a moment, that it had not rained upon the earth up until the flood. You read in Genesis, well, how did the vegetation get watered? It all got watered from the ground up with a dew, with a mist. So that's how the earth was watered. So they had never seen rain or heard of it before. Only thing that they did know was through the prophetic utterances that God was about to do something. He was about to bring judgment, but they didn't heed the warning. And these preachers were preaching, I'm telling you it's going to rain, it's going to flood, the earth's going to flood, and he's they, telling them rain's gonna, water's going to come out of the sky. I want you to just kind of think about being back at that time, and you had never seen rain, or like in, maybe in parts of India, you've never seen snow. It's hard for you to understand. 
Little white things falling down, piling up, and cars slipping all over, people slipping and sliding, getting in accidents. Never, never saw that before. It's hard for them to understand that. So here they're telling the people, look, the earth is about to be destroyed. God is going to bring his judgment. But isn't it interesting? Before the flood comes, one week before the flood comes, Methuselah dies. A relative of Noah. And the period of mourning for the Jews is seven days. And it was after the seventh day that Noah entered the ark. That's not a coincidence. So as it was in the days of Noah before the flood, people were just going on in their everyday business, just minding their business, doing their thing, getting up, going to work, doing their thing, going and buying and selling, you know, eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. Everything was going as normal. And here comes a prophet, Noah, and he begins to tell them as he's building this ark in a place where there's no oceans. Think about it. Yeah, that's what they thought. He was crazy. So just think about it. Someone where there's no ocean, maybe like the middle of Montana or something, building this boat, this huge luxury liner, and telling people and warning, God's going to bring judgment. He's going to bring a flood. And they mocked him. They ridiculed him. Okay, he was preaching. And, you know, I want to just say this to any preacher that might be watching. Don't get discouraged in your ministry if you don't see a large amount of people coming. As it was in the days of Noah. They weren't listening. They weren't taking heed to the message. Come on, somebody. They were not listening. The majority were not listening. They were going on their own way, doing their merry thing, but that didn't stop Noah. He kept on building. Okay? And he had sons that were, that were old enough to help him, and they were building this ark. Now, I often wonder what their, their sons must have thought about, you know, as they're building this thing. And, you know, it took over, over 100 days to build this thing. Think about that. Was it 100 days? 100 years. Yeah, it was 100 years. It was 100 years of building this thing day after day, day after day, day after day. It's going to rain 30 days later. It's going to rain. God's going to bring judgment six months later. God's going to bring judgment one year later. God's going to bring judgment. Why do you think it took 100 years? Huh? Right there. What did you say? God's mercy. God gave them space of time to repent. As it was in the days of Noah. Are we seeing that today? Are we seeing real, true men of God that are preaching this word uncompromisingly? And their churches are suffering and their little churches but they're preaching the truth, and they keep they go out and they preach the truth and tell people, and they don't want to hear it. They don't want to be a part of a church that's biblical. They want to be a part of a church that doesn't cause them to be committed at all. They can come and go as they please, and no one questions them. They don't have any ministry in the church. They just come, sit down, pay their little dues or whatever they do, and then end up leaving. And there's no ministry as it was in the days of Noah. So shall it be in the end times. And it was like that until the day that Noah entered into the ark. The ark is a type, I believe, of the rapture. What's going to happen to your loved ones when you're taken up? They're going to start to cry out then. They're going to say, was it true? Or will there be a strong delusion that they would believe a lie? Because along with the truth, Jesus said, 
as it was in the days of Noah. He also warned them and told them, Be not deceived, for many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. Hello? Deceive them about what? What true salvation is? What the true church is? Come on. Come on. Uh, I, was, I had somebody on Facebook that I was associated with, no longer associated with. I uh, brought them some correction because they were lying. They were liars. And uh, they wrote back to me, well, you'll see when we have a big ministry. You'll see that God is with us when we have a big ministry. I wrote back to him. I said, Jesus said these words. Not all that say, Lord, Lord, unto me shall, not, shall enter the kingdom of God. And they said, they said, but Lord, haven't we prophesied in your name? Haven't we done many wonderful works, cast out devils, healed the sick? And I said, and Jesus said, depart from me. I never knew you. And that's what I told him. You want to know I got no more response, no more, no more conversation. Don't come to me and tell me you've got a big ministry and that proves that you're right with God because that's a bunch of phony baloney. God told me you never judge according to appearance. You judge righteously. Let's go to verse 39. It says, And they knew it not until the flood came and took them all away. Wow. So you knowing this, me knowing this. Are we in the last days? Are we in the days of Noah? Well, pastor, I'm not so sure. Well, let's look at the book of Luke. Let's go to Luke for a moment. I'll give you the chapter as soon as I get there. Give me one second here. Uh, let me see where that is. I wasn't going to stick this in there, but I, I feel I should. Luke 21. I'm still not, I still don't see it. Hold on, wait a minute. Let me see if I can find it. What's that? 17? Yes, thank you. Luke uh, 17. Uh, verse 28. Oh, you're there already? Likewise, also as it was... In the days of Lot. What happened in the days of Lot? Well, we, we know that. That's the biggie one. But what are the other things that happened during the days of Lot? This is very interesting. 
Well, that was the big thing. But there was other little things that took place too that we just kind of skim over when we just read fast. What, was, what was else was going on? Go back and read in Genesis about Lot. Huh? Lot was, was emotion, he made emotional decisions based upon what he saw versus on what he should have been doing, being led by the Spirit. That was prevalent in his day. Remember, because Abraham said, look, we're fighting, our, our people are fighting, we don't have enough room for our stock. You choose between the plains or the mountains, whatever you want to do, you choose, right? And he looked over the plain, and he went by what he saw, and he said, this plain is good because there's water and all things. I'll take the plain. So Abraham took the mountains. But there's a sad commentary there because it says in Genesis that, that Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom. He went by his emotions and his feelings. What looked good. Can I tell you, we're living in that day today. The church no longer stands on firm biblical foundations of truth, but how they feel. And they make the decisions on the church based on how they feel. And they choose the watered plains, but they pitch their tent towards Sodom. They pitch their tents towards sin and no change in their life and not being renewed and not being refreshed but they look to Sodom, the way of the world, and they have the way of the world, and they live like the world, they talk like the world, but they come to church. Hello? As it was in the days of Lot. Disrespected authority. His uncle was older than him. What he should have done, in my if, in my estimation, what he should have done is said, Uncle, you're the elder. You're my elder. You choose what you want. I'll take the leftover. Respect for authority. Gone. We don't see that today. Respect for pastors in America. There's no respect. You got people that because uh, somebody doesn't visit them or doesn't call them or shake their hand, they don't come to church anymore. But they forget about the 99 good things you did. Come on, somebody. It's living in that time, in that era. We're in that era. He says, they did eat. They drank. Uh-oh. And they did what? They bought. And they sold. In other words, commerce and the economy was thriving. You can only buy and sell if you've got money. Come on. So it had to be a thriving economy that was happening during the time of Lot. Guess what? We're living in a time of a thriving economy. Hello? They planted. They're planting all over the place. They're building, they're planting. Look at what they're building. Look at the buildings that are going up. All kinds of buildings. I was just going into Boston uh, the, the, the last trip I went in, and they're building a new tower, a new high-rise, right near uh, the Prudential building. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. How do they fit that in there? And they're building everywhere. Not only in our country, but all the countries. Economies are booming, buildings. Everybody's building, building, building. Verse 29. But the same day, the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed some of them. Uh-uh. Destroyed them all. You ever wonder why people in the world, 
today don't want to hear the truth? Think about it. I mean the truth. They don't want to hear the truth. They don't want the truth. The Bible says that God's going to send them a strong delusion that they would believe a lie. Why? Because they love not the truth, nor the way of salvation. So God will give them up to their own reprobate minds. What's a reprobate mind? It's a mind that thinks that they can go on living without God. That's my definition of a reprobate mind. A person who thinks they can live their life on this earth without God. That's terrible. That's, a, that's one of the worst things a person can have a, a grip on their mind, is that they can live without God or any interference with God or any kind of interrelationship with God in this life. Until they were destroyed. And it says in verse 30, Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Now we understand that's talking about the second coming. Right? When the Son of Man is going to be revealed, the Bible says, and every eye shall see him, even those that will look upon him whom they have pierced. That's Israel. They're going to see who he was. Every eye shall see him. But then there's another coming before the second coming, which we call the rapture. So applying these principles, all the ones that we had learned, the comparative mention principle, the progressive mention, the complete mention, the covenantal principle, the ethnic division principle, the chron uh, chronometrical principle. You got them all in your book. The, the, the breach principle, the Christocentric principle, the moral principle. All of these principles, the symbolic language, figures of speech, all of those things have to be included in the scripture itself to get the proper interpretation. Now, not all of them may be there. But you have to look at these principles in this book. Read your book again. Go through your book. Just don't toss it on the shelf. And Okay, now it's over. Forget it. No, go back and so that you can practice these things. You can look at the scriptures and say, hmm, what was going on during the time of Noah? Most of us know the big things. What was going on during the time of Lot? What was, what was the story with Lot and Abraham? Why did, he want his, why did he want his tent pitched toward Sodom when they understood and knew what that, that town was all about? <clears throat> so one of the other signs, the big ones, that Christ would come back again is the sign of the rise of homosexual, homosexuality. Think about it. And in those days, it was so perverse that when the angels of God came to Abraham, these men want to have sexual relations with these angels. That's how perverted they were. Today, we got men that think they're women and women that think they're men. You go into a grocery store, you go into a Target, you go somewhere. They don't have male bathrooms and female now. It's unisex bathroom. So if Joe feels like being a woman today, he can be a woman and go into a woman's bath bathroom with little girls going to the bathroom. That's sick. That's a sick society. When they can't understand, they can't even have common sense and reason to understand that a boy is a boy and a girl is a girl. And then they look at us and they, they condemn us and say we're, 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 we're crazy and we're not acceptance of that, those things. And there's something wrong with us. There's nothing wrong with us. There's something wrong with them. They're worshiping the creature rather than the creator. They're changing the, the natural use that God has and changing it for unnatural use. That's a sign of the coming of Jesus Christ. 
No other time has it been more prevalent than it is now. Think about it. It's all over the place. And you got women going out to these marches and holding signs. I had my best abortion ever. I mean, come on. And yet they're trying to stand up for, for mothers and, and babies, uh, immigrants that are coming across and being torn from their parents. But they're not even ta- thinking about the baby that was torn out of their womb. The hypocrisy. We're living in a time. Understand that during the time of, 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 of Abraham and on until this time, they, were worship, they worshiped false gods. They offered their children up as sacrifices. We offer our children up as sacrifices through abortion. Hello? We're living in the last days. So these are some of the principles that we'll, you need to look at. So in conclusion, what do I conclude about the passage? What we were talking about, two shall be taken, one shall be left. That One's going to be right with God and the other one isn't. One's going to be ready, the other one isn't. And you compare it with other scripture about the oil. There was ten virgins, right? Five were taken, five were left behind. Why? Because they didn't have enough oil. What does that tell you? So applying these principles that you've learned, and you've got those principles, we talked about them, we've gone over them, you've got them in your book, Go over those principles again when you read a scripture and you want to know a little bit more in depth about that scripture. Read it. Comprehend it. Ask the questions. Who was speaking? Who were they speaking to? Why were they speaking? When were they speaking? How was it brought forth? Was it brought forth through another person? Or was it brought through uh, the person himself like Paul? Was it him writing uh, himself? Or was somebody taking dictation from Paul and was writing it on his behalf? Understand these things. Understand if it was a cultural thing. Understand if it was something that was given to them, but not necessarily to us. And we know that from the scripture when we studied that in Matthew about um, uh, when you see these signs, flee to Judea. Now, if that was for us, that means we all have to get on a plane when we see these things and go to Israel and go to Judah, Judea rather. So it's not talking about us. It's not talking to us. It's talking to that specific generation in Israel that when they see these things happening, so that way you and I don't go crazy and, and buy our tickets now, okay, with an open-end flight, you know. And believe me, there will probably be some people that will do that. When they start to see all these things coming to pass and, and all this stuff, they say, oh, man, we're in the end times. They're going to get a plane and go to Judea. That's like... Back in 1988, 88 reasons why Jesus was coming in 1988, if you remember that. They gave a specific date. Yes. They're going to get what? (laughs) It's so important that you and I know this word. I don't know if you saw the news, but China is coming against Christian churches now. Really bad now. I mean, closing them down, burning them down, whatever. The the government's coming against them. The doors are being closed in Russia right now. And very slowly, the doors are being closed in India. What is that telling you? Here's another sign. Here's another way that you can incorporate this into Understanding Scripture. Remember, Scripture interprets Scripture. So take one Scripture, but make sure you have a lot of other Scriptures saying the same thing. What's the other thing that's going to happen in the last days? There's going to be a great falling away. Now, when Paul told that to Timothy, he wasn't just talking about Christians. He was talking about leaders, churches, is going to be a, for the, they're not going to they're not going to follow the truth, but give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. 
There's going to be churches that are going to be fall, falling away, listening to demons and false spirits and false teachings that are creeping into the church. And we see it all the time in churches today. We see about 2,000 churches today that are closing every single, uh, I think it was every single month. Pastors are leaving the ministry. They're going out and getting secular jobs. Uh, it's just getting more and more harder to do God's work because of discouragement and because of depression. We see that. We're in the end times. Deception is going to be one of the greatest weapons the enemy uses in the last days to deceive people and tell them, oh, you don't need to go to church. You, or you need to go to this church. This church is here, and, and we got all the programs and all this stuff, and you know we're going to do all this stuff. Well, we look at the seven churches in Revelation, and we see the last church is the church of Laodicea. And what was their problem? They were lukewarm. Tell me honestly if you think the church of Jesus Christ today is lukewarm. I'm not saying everybody, but I'm saying a lot of the churches today, they're lukewarm. Why are they lukewarm? Why? Compromise. I told you that was one of Satan's greatest weapons. Compromise. They compromise the truth. They compromise the things in the word. They compromise Somebody was telling me the other day, I forgot who it was. They were watching something and they saw on Facebook that the whole worship team was in shorts. And the pastor too. Now watch this. This is where the deception comes. Oh, don't you become legalistic now. No, it's not being about legalistic. You've moved the, 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 you've moved the needle of modesty over. It's not talking about legalism now. You're talking about modesty. And don't come tell me when you have a woman's conference and you've got the assistant, one of the assistant pastors in his underwear playing a guitar at a ladies' conference in New York City at Hillsong Church. Don't come and tell me when you have choir directors that they're homosexual lovers and they're going to get married and they're in your church. Don't tell me you don't know that. If you don't know that as a pastor, you don't belong pastoring. If you can't sense that spirit and have the discerning spirit, you don't belong in the ministry. Come on. See, people, people don't like that kind of preaching. Come on now. If you, if you just kind of calm down a little bit, pastor, you know, we could have a full church. You don't preach the truth. If you just kind of, you know, you can still preach the truth, but kind of tone it down a little bit. Yeah. Do we want a full church that way? Do we want to allow things to happen in the church that are not right, not moral, just so we can have a full church? No. A, su a successful pastor doesn't get his success from how many people are in his church. A pastor gets his success by doing the will of God wherever that may be. And that's why I give credit to like Pastor Manny, you know, who struggles so much at times with attendance and with people and, you know, ministry and all that. But you know what? He's still there. Amen. He's one of the few, but they're still there. I can name you others that have left the ministry, but he's still there. I'm still here. Does the enemy come in like a flood at times? Yes. No, you could be doing something else. You could be doing something greater. No, I could be doing something else, something greater, but guess what? I wouldn't be in God's will. So my success isn't based upon what I do. My success is based on where I am and where I'm doing God's will. And if I'm doing God's will, I'm successful, even if it's one person. It doesn't matter. Amen? Did you learn something? I hope you did. So now that concludes our study on hermeneutics. In our next study, Joe's going to come and give us a lesson in physics. 
and why the world was shaped the way it was. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But I'll tell you, that would, be, that would be an interesting study. Yes. I can give an announcement. Next Thursday, 6 p.m., right here, we're having prayer for evangelism. So let me ask you a question. If, we, if we're in the last days, and we are, and if Jesus is coming, and all the signs are being, and you know what's great about the signs? It wasn't like, you know, there was an earthquake here or an earthquake there, and then there was a, there was a, 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 a pestilence here or a famine there. But as you see, all of them escalating all together. That's what's happening in the world. They're escalating all together. There's wars and rumors of wars and all this stuff's going on in Syria and all this other stuff. And, and uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, September, uh, September, what was it, September 20th or something like that of 2016, they dedicated the Temple of Baal in New York City, the gate to the Temple of Baal in New York City. 